Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the October 3rd inaugural meeting of Glendale's Charter Review Committee. Um, item number one, regular business agenda. The agenda for October 3rd, 2024, regular meeting of the Charter Review Committee was posted on September 30th, 2024 on the bulletin board outside of City Hall. I am going to call roll. Committee members Durham. Here. Garibian. Here. Smith. Here. Povolitis. Present. Miller. Here. Manisarian. Haratunian. Present. Megradician. Present. Carpetian. Here. You. Present. Meek. Here. And Flower. Here. Thank you. One second, checking our technical system. Okay, item two, oral communications. Discussion is limited to items not a part of this agenda. Each speaker is allowed three minutes. The committee may question or respond to the speaker, but there will be no debate or discussion. The Charter Review Committee lead may refer to the matter or to staff for investigation and report. And committee members, we do not have any callers on the line. Item three are minutes. There are no minutes as this is the inaugural meeting. So item four, business discussion items. 4A is introductions, committee and staff. Do you wanna start, Greg? Uh, yeah, the PowerPoint. Oh no, I meant do you wanna start your, you wanna introduce yourself first? Oh sure, yeah. yeah. Um, my name is Greg Kaijo, Innovation Project Manager in the Management Services Department of the City of Glendale. Uh, let, me, let me start and then we'll go around and, and uh, introduce everybody else. Uh, my name is Mike Garcia, I'm the City Attorney. Uh, I wanna thank you all for um, volunteering uh, for this uh, role uh, that the Council um, wants to engage in, uh, this process that the Council wants to engage in. Um, uh, we'll get into a little bit more details as we go through, but um, uh, we, this inaugural meeting is to really start this process. We have an election in June of 2026. So um, the council will have some, has some uh, matters that, the, that wants this committee to look at, but I think there'll be a broader scope depending on, on what the council says. But anyway, I just want to introduce myself. Let me introduce um, uh, to my right is Aaron Israel. Um, uh, I'm Aaron Israel, I'm a senior assistant to city attorney Garcia. And so Aaron, Aaron and Lucy Varpetian, uh, also principal assistant city attorney and Sylvia Quash, uh, Assistant City Attorney, will be helping uh, throughout this process. My hope is I will probably be speaking a lot today, and then as time as we get through this process, hopefully they'll be speaking more, they'll be making more of the presentations. Uh, and so that'll be, you know, we'll, we'll get into that. But um, uh, just to give you a little background, Lucy was the advisor to the um, charter, along with Scott Howard, the City Attorney at the time, the Charter Review Committee that was in place from 2002 to 2004. So she brings a lot of experience and sort of the institutional knowledge. And then um, Aaron and Sylvia are newer to the office, but very excited to be part of this process. So f with that, I, you know, I don't know how we want to, when we start with Denise and then work our way around for everybody to introduce yourself, tell, you, tell us about how you got involved and why you want to participate in this committee. Nice to meet you, everyone. My name is Denise Miller. I grew up next door in Eagle Rock and I've lived in Glendale for 20 years. This is a great city. I've been involved for quite a while. I started in the city of Glendale as a commissioner on the status of women um, and I'm honored to be on this committee. What I hope to really contribute um, will hopefully um, highlight the background that I can share with all of your expertise is my work in policy. I've been on a state license board of occupational therapy for 12 years, California, and um, I work for a highly regulatory health plan with all kinds of regulations in the state of California, so I'm used to looking at that language. And I, I come out of the healthcare sector at uh, Adventist Health Glendale. I had a long career there, but now I'm at HealthNet, and it's great to meet you all. I look forward to working with you. I'm 
Asia. And uh, the reason why I volunteered for this committee is that my work involved like statewide like policy education and I wanted something like local that I want to do something that impact my community, so that's why I decided to get involved. Nice to meet you all. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lily Tarutunian. I'm an attorney. My background um, is in the arts and music. I've been involved in various nonprofit organizations throughout the 27 years I've been in Glendale. Um, however, I wanted to contribute to more of the policies and laws, whatever changes our city needs for the future and currently, so I'm very excited to be part of this commission and very happy to meet all of you today. Thank you. Carl Povoletis, been living in the city since 1990 when I joined the police department, uh, retired in 2022 as the uh, police chief. Um, Still an adjunct professor up at Glendale Community College. I've been doing that since about 1993 uh, and, and work with various other nonprofit organizations in here. Uh, what I'm looking at from perspective here is hope I can share a perspective of has, have, having been a person who has worked on the other side being a practitioner within government and also a resident of the city of Glendale. Uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing the perspectives from everybody else because I think the way we're going to make this move forward is to make sure we have some cognitive diversity and we take a look at various things and we set the city up for a good future. Hello, my name is Stephen Weeks. I've lived in the city for about 44 years. Uh, I spent my th first 30 years working in the film industry and after I retired, I... Uh, Your microphone is Stephen. It's on. Okay. <laughs> Can you hear it? I started volunteering for various uh, nonprofits trying to make the city a better place to live. Uh, I'm a past president and former commission member of the Community Services and Parks. Uh, I'm hoping to bring just uh, reasonable changes to our charter so that the city can continue moving forward and making the quality of life better for the citizens. Thank you. I'm Alan Durham, 30-year resident of Glendale. I first came to the LA area to go to MBA school at USC. Then I worked for PricewaterhouseCoopers and then for a Fortune 100 uh, company who had corporate headquarters here in the finance and treasury department. Uh, once I retired, I got much more involved in uh, civic matters in Glendale and started watching the council meetings. Um, now I typically, the last couple of years, I attend them in person and often speak on issues that concern me. I'm also on the board of the Northwest Glendale Homeowners Association and their representative to the Glendale Homeowners Coordinating Council. Thank you. Linda Magardichian. Um, I'm a full-time engineer. Um, I work as a digital hardware designer. I've been living in Glendale for 12 years. I'm also a part-time faculty member at California University uh, State Northridge. Uh, I've been part of nonprofit organizations since I can remember. Um, so part, being part of the nonprofits has uh, kind of created the count, mm, sense of community in me and that's why I love to give back to the community and make the city that we live in a better place and um, I, I'm willing to play my role and my part in this and work with all of you guys. It's great to meet you all. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Brian Smith. Uh, I've only been in Glendale for six years but four different apartments. Uh, every side of the Americana, you can imagine. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, my first time on any kind of committee or municipal work, and I just always wanted to get involved, so I'm very excited to be here. Uh, very different background. I'm a TV writer, mostly kids' animation. And so, yeah, I'm happy to provide some of that alternate perspective to all the lawyers here. Yeah. Thanks so much. <laughs> happy to be here. Hi, uh, Paul Karapetian. I uh, just shy of 13 years in the city of Glendale, uh, raising a a family of kids who are not so young anymore, uh, but but uh, uh, I got involved uh, because I felt this was an important enough issue for the city in terms of setting it up for the future, and I thought it'd be a good opportunity to try to give back. So I look forward to working with you. 
Stephen Flower. Um, I guess it's been about 10 years uh, since I moved here. Um, I, I'm a, an attorney. I practice. I, I'm in private practice, but I represent public agencies and cities. Um, so uh, I have a certain professional interest here, but um, honestly, this is my first time on this side, <laughs> the non-city attorney side of the table. So um, I'm looking forward to uh, being able to put my professional expertise to work at home. Um, I'm Ani Karibian. Um, lived in the city for a long time. Uh, was a planner here for a few years and then went to San Luis Obispo County. Now I'm at Pasadena, planner again. So hopefully I can bring those experiences here. Um, but my degree is in environment and sustainable development. So I'm hoping that those skills can also be beneficial to the future of the city. Thank you. Okay, item five, reports, information only. 5A, review of applicable laws, Brown Act, Public Records Act, and City of Glendale's Code of Conduct. Okay, um, well, so this int introductory meeting is to just give you um, some introduction to some of the the rules and policies that apply to us, to you as a, as a body, as a legislative body. Uh, appointed by the city council on a particular subject matter. We're gonna cover just brief the Brown Act in a little bit of detail, which is our open meeting law, as well as the Public Records Act as it applies to you, as a, which governs obviously public records or writings. And then we'll talk about uh, as, uh, our code of conduct. The city council adopted a code of conduct that applies to itself as well as to all the members of the boards and commissions and committees uh, in, in regarding uh, dealing with the public, dealing with each other, uh, dealing with staff. Uh, and then we'll get into some of the other components uh, of the discussion. We will get a little bit into the detail about what, what is being asked of the committee uh, later on uh, in, uh, on item C. So I, I have the misfortune of the present the screen being behind me, so I'm gonna be reviewing to my, my, my paper and then maybe asking somebody to change the slide. So, um, we will start with the, the Ralph M. Brown Act. Um, this is the open meeting law that applies to this particular body. Um, and the Brown Act uh, and, and the Public Record, Records Act work together uh, to promote transparency in local government. Um, and I do, the presentation's up, but I also provided a hard copy of this presentation. So uh, the Public Records Act is intended to ensure that the public has the right to all writings that pertain to the public's business, uh, while the Brown Act uh, requires that uh, the city conduct its meetings in an open and public uh, uh, fashion with limited exceptions as it's called out for. So the general rule is anytime a, a board or commission is meeting uh, pertaining to the public's business, that, that meeting has to be open to the public. Next slide, please. So the, the Brown Act uh, has been in place since 1953, uh, but probably was not, um, it, it didn't have a lot of teeth for, for a number of decades until the, the legislature uh, strengthened it over, over time. So the, the purpose, obviously, as I stated, uh, of the Brown Act is to ensure that actions be taken openly and that the deliberations of the, of the bodies that govern the particular public agency are conducted openly. Um, and then the, the, another purpose that's stated, and again, these purposes have been in the, in the legislation since the, the beginning, um, be that the people insist on remaining informed so that they may retain control over the instruments, meaning the, the governing bodies that they have created. And, um, you know, I, I, as I noted, the, the, the Brown Act has been on the books since, 53, since 1953, more than 70 years, but uh, over time it, be, it became to be more enforceable by either in civil courts or district attorney's offices or, or um, uh, those are the two primary ways. But um, I will tell a little story. Um, my, my father was a, was a, uh, worked in public, uh, for a public agency, he worked in government for a long time. And uh, his, as a management intern in a nearby city in the 60s, as I said, the law was on the books, but it was not enforced. And so he would tell me stories about how um, uh, they, before the council meetings, the council would, would get, to, get together with the city manager in the back room and they would decide how they were gonna vote. 
who was going to introduce what item and whatnot. Obviously, that's a far cry from what we have to deal with today. Uh, that activity doesn't occur, at least it doesn't occur in Glendale. Um, if it does occur in other places, there are very strong remedies uh, for such activity. So anyway, that's kind of how this law has progressed over time. It's definitely an enforceable tool for the public to have access uh, to government and to make their uh, opinions known to government and to ensure that uh, public agencies um, act in the public interest. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the, as I noted, the main purpose of the Brown Act is to ensure that the decision-making processes of the legislative bodies of local agencies are conducted in public, open to public scrutiny, um, except where this legislature has very expressly and very narrowly provided exceptions. Next, next slide. So some of the general requirements that are applicable um, to under the Brown Act. So there are, um, yeah, it applies obviously to legislative bodies. Um, it has requirements for agendas and it has requirements for public comment. Legislative bodies, such as this one, may not meet uh, to discuss, hear, or deliberate on matters within your subject matter jurisdiction unless you do so under open, at an open and public meeting. Um, there are requirements for agendas, which we'll touch on a little bit. Obviously, anything that the, the, this particular body uh, desires to discuss or take action on must be on an agenda. And then the third comp main component of, of the Brown Act is that the public have the right to attend these meetings now either virtually or via telephone, uh, and then also um, comment uh, before the public agency on any, any matter within the subject, just subject matter jurisdiction. So what's a legislative body? A legislative body is the governing body of the local agency, so our city council, and any, any commission, board, or committee created by formal action of the legislative body. Uh, so in this case, the city council took an action, adopted a resolution uh, or motion, I think, to formally create this committee. Even though it's a, a limited duration, it's still subject to uh, the requirements of the Brown Act. Um, there are some exceptions. So if, uh, for example, you have an ad hoc committee of a particular uh, board or commission or city council that is a limited duration, it doesn't have a standing jurisdiction, uh, then that uh, a, a subcommittee of, a, of less than majority of the, of the body, body members uh, can engage in a discussion, for example. Next slide, please. And by the way, if you have questions, feel free to in interrupt me. I will stop at the end of the Brown Act component and see if there are any questions. Um, so the act applies to what are called meetings. Uh, what's a meeting? It, uh, it's a congregation of majority of, of the members of the legislative body. So we have 12 of you, or there, there's 11 now, but there's 12 of you on this body. So anytime seven or more of you uh, are uh, intending to meet, discuss matters bef that are within your purview, it requires you comply with the Brown Act. And, and it, it, uh, it applies when the, meet, when the committee meets at the same time and place, and we'll discuss what that means, uh, to hear, discuss, or deliberate, or take action on anything with Within your subject matter jurisdiction. Next slide, please. So there are some exceptions uh, to the Brown Act, um, to the requirement that when you are all in the same room, or majority of you are in the same room, there are some exceptions. So when uh, there's a conference or similar gathering exception, um, and that that exception applies uh, as it states when there's a conference of a, uh, that pertains to something that's of public interest, that's open to the public, uh, and and as long as the particular board or commission is not discussing anything amongst themselves that's within your subject matter jurisdiction, uh, other than as part of the program. So if there's a conference on a land use matter or there's a conference on charter cities and the majority of you were to attend, it would be okay for you to be there as long as you're not talking amongst yourselves other than as part of the program. There's a community meeting exception. So we have um, various community meetings that are, are put on by different organizations, whether it be Northwest or another organization, and a majority of a, a legislative body can attend such a community meeting as long as the, the city did not um, uh, organize that particular community meeting. And as long, again, as long as you're not talking about sub something that's uh, uh, not within your subject matter jurisdiction other than as part of the organized program. Um, it's uh, permissible for a, a uh, body to uh, attend the notice, open and notice meeting of another legislative body. So I anticipate, you know, there might be times where the city council is discussing the work of this committee, um, and it would be acceptable for this this committee to attend that that council meeting uh, to have a discussion with the council or to be part of that discussion. Another exception is. Um, 
uh, social or ceremonial occasion. So there was a this afternoon. Some of you may have been there at the the fire awards luncheon. That was a social ceremonial occasion. Uh, no business was conducted, um, and it was permissible for a majority of our council members who were there to be there. And then individual contacts. So individual contacts between you and another committee member, or individual contacts between between you and staff. Again, as long as a, a a majority of you are not engaged in these collective uh, discussions, which I'll discuss serial meetings in a little bit. Those are some of the applicable exceptions. Uh, the Attorney General, General of California recently had the opportunity to put some definition to some of these. Um, as you know, our city and many cities have at some point what's called the State of the City event, where typically the Chamber of Commerce puts on an event. Um, invites the public, usually there's a charge to attend. Um, it's generally not for city business, although in most of these state city events, including ours, the mayor may make a presentation on what's going on in the city. And the attorney general uh, determined that that did not fall within any of these exceptions uh, because uh, the community meeting exception, the, uh, the attorney general decided that it wasn't applicable because that, that particular event, most state of the city events, there's a charge, so it's not truly open to the public. Um, same with the social ceremony occasion, although it was largely a social ceremony occasion, um, mostly to recognize in that case the business, the Chamber of Commerce in that particular city, um, because there was city business discussed with the mayor, again, discussing what was going on in the city, that exception didn't apply. So that's, that's an example of how these, these apply. I'm um, happy to answer any questions on that, but uh, I, don't, I don't foresee that as, as a huge problem. I just wanted to give you a little update on that. Next slide, please. So one of the problems that we encounter sometimes in local government, especially with um, uh, committees or, or boards or councils that are smaller in size, five members, where it really only takes three mem members to develop a concurrence to have a majority, is that the Brown Act uh, was amended after it was adopted to prohibit what are called serial meetings. And serial meetings are the use of, of direct communication, whether it's intermediaries, technological devices, employed by a majority of the legislative body to develop a collective concurrence as to some action that's gonna be taken by that body. So this, this, uh, next, um, this next slide, um, so, so essentially it's, it's, it's to prevent the use of email or text or inter, inter, personal intermediaries, whether it's a member of a border commission, a third party, uh, a newspaper reporter, to develop a concurrence about some issue that's gonna be before that particular body. And this sort of serial discussion can, can be, uh, can violate the Brown Act if it facilitates an agreement or compromise among the members or advances an understanding that the, that the board members have about a particular issue uh, or advances or clarifies uh, an understanding of an issue. There's a couple of different types of, of uh, serial meetings. There's one, um, actually go to the next slide, Greg. Next slide. So there's, there's what's called the chain where if you assume, for example, you had a five member, um, a board or commission where Commissioner A speaks to Commissioner B, tells that commissioner how he or she intends to vote or how they're thinking about a particular issue, and then Commissioner B then goes and tells Commissioner C not only how they're feeling or, or thinking about an issue, but what Commissioner A said. And that's, that, is, you know, that is what's a, defined as a serial meeting. If you have that sort of discussion where there's a collective concurrence, even though A, B, and C did not meet in the same room at the same time to discuss something, uh, when these discussions are held outside of the Notice Brown Act uh, process, there is the potential for violation of the Brown Act. Um, so, you know, I'll get into some tips later, but obviously one of them will be, you know, make, if you have one-on-one -on -one contacts, try to limit those. Um, and it, I, I do think it would be hard to have a serial meeting with a committee this size, but again, it's, it's important to maintain, to not have multiple conversations with, with each other outside of this process to potentially avoid um, a Brown Act violation. Another type of um, potential serial meeting is this sort of hub and spoke, where this, this um, uh, one member is maybe having multiple conversations with multiple and then sort of develops a concurrence that way. Um, oddly, in a prior life, I've seen this happen with newspaper reporters contacting city council members and polling them 
and then calling them all back and saying, hey, looks like the votes are there, the votes are not there. That is technically a violation of the Brown Act. I don't know how that's enforceable. I don't know if you've dealt with that, Steve, but um, it, it, that does happen from time to time. So again, even, you know, suggestion is if you are having individual conversations with, with uh, each other outside to li try to limit those to avoid the potential for a serial meeting in violation of the Brown Act. This is some of the ways, the, uh, next slide please. These are obviously some of the ways that, that serial meetings can occur. I've seen it you know, in my life, in my professional life, oftentimes either personal conversations or emails, just um, uh, maybe you know, in that example where I showed you where Commissioner A was talking to Commissioner B, Commissioner A maybe had no idea that Commissioner B was then gonna go talk to the rest of them. So it's important when you do have those conversations, please you know, to ask that those conversations be maintained on a confidential basis. So this is uh, just something to be, be wary of uh, in the context of serial meetings. Next slide, please. So even though um, the Brown Act applies to uh, majority action, action taken by majority or meetings of a majority of a board of commission, uh, a few years ago the legislature uh, took action to uh, have specific rules as applicable to social media. And um, even though it only take, it take, it would take, for example, seven of you to violate the Brown Act, um, the, the uh, specific rules uh, under AB 992 provides that um, a member may not respond directly to any communication on social media that is open and accessible to the public um, regarding agency business on an internet, internet platform. That's, and that's likes or thumbs up or emojis. Um, and so that's if, if, just give an example, if one of you were to post something that you believe in with respect to this, this committee's work or some action that you took the night before, or just a comment about this committee's work, and then any of you, any others were to respond to that on social media, assuming that was an open page, uh, that's a violation of this particular provision of the Brown Act. And I, you know, my understanding is that the reason, the, the, the reasoning behind this was the thing with social media is that it moves so quickly, right? It moves at light speed, and so, you, you know, somebody may like a comment and not realize that somebody else had already liked a particular comment made by, by one of the fellow, fellow board members and all of a sudden you had a Brown Act violation, so it was easier to stop it right at, right at one. So that's a sp specific rule to, uh, with respect to um, social media. Next slide, please. Uh, there are some exceptions to that. Um, any any legislative body member, uh, uh, any member of this committee who gets a question on social media, you can respond to that. You can provide some information. You can solicit information from the public. Uh, that's acceptable. It's just be careful, obviously, about responding to anything one of your fellow committee members says in the context of a social media post. Um, and again, j next slide, please. Um, this, this rule applies only to social media pages that are truly open to the public. If it's a private page, uh, if access has been blocked, um, if there's a, there's a charge to join that particular, then it doesn't apply. This is truly something where if you have an Instagram page or tr Twitter, it applies to that when it's truly open to the public. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, thank you. Um, so I, I kind of covered this already, but again, it's just be very careful on social media as it relates. If, if you are on social media, just please be careful in the context of the work of this committee um, and avoid you know, uh, uh, too much comment as it pertains to uh, the, the work of this, of this committee. Next slide, please. Yeah. So let's say I saw a posting on social media about what we do, like some general public. Can I comment or like can I like, dislike on that post? Or? If it, you can, if it, uh, as long as it's not a comment from somebody on this committee. Okay, so I yeah. can comment to general public's comment about yeah. our work. Sure. And do I need to tell them that I'm, I'm on this committee or that does it matter whether they know that I'm on this committee? I think it's advisable, just, just so that members are aware, uh, mem the members of the public are aware that you're coming from, but I don't know that it's, it's not legally required. Um, and then with respect to the, the serial meetings and just meetings in general um, and, and email, um, you know, the caution always is to avoid reply all. So if we, if staff sends you something, uh, the agenda, the packet sends you some information or a member of the public sends the entire committee uh, a, a, a comment like I think the committee should 
adopt the charter and with these provisions or get rid of the charter, then it's really important that you not hit reply all. Uh, that that then triggers the potential for Brown Act or an actual Brown Act violation. Once that more, what was that? that yeah, yeah, and so have I. I mean, that's a, that's a common thing, especially when email was new. It was like, hey, stop doing that. Um, it's a little happens in my experience. It happens a little bit less uh, than it used to. But again, just be very careful. Same thing. Do not you know be careful not to take a position or com a commitment on something uh, before the 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 the. Um, a public position in an email before, at least before you've had a chance to discuss it amongst the committee and deliberate on it, just because then that's that's a potential for Brown Act violation too, because if you say something publicly about how you feel about a particular issue, then you know other committees may see that and understand this is where you're coming from already and there, there's a potential for a Brown Act violation in that way. And just you know ensure compliance with the law. So next slide please. So um, there are a, a couple of different types of meetings. Um, under the Brown Act, there's what's called a regular meeting. So when the city council meets every Tuesday, unless that means canceled, uh, this committee will be meeting on the first Thursday of the month. Um, so those regular meetings require that an, an, an agenda and a notice be posted uh, publicly um, 72 hours before the meeting with the items that are, on the, are gonna be on the agenda, the items that are gonna be discussed by this, this particular body. There are times where um, a body may need to meet under what's called a special meeting notice. Uh, that's with 24 hours notice. Um, and that just, again, when, when an agenda is posted with 24 hours, the, the, the committee can only discuss the items that are on that particular agenda. Um, and we'll discuss, I think there's a couple of slides down here, we'll kind of discuss a little bit of the distinction. But um, I don't, initially I think we'll be having regular meetings where we're meeting that first Thursday of the month. But as we, I think, as the committee starts to ramp up its work and we get closer, it's probable we'll have more meetings than once a month. And then so those meetings will, will be special meetings uh, of this body. Another type of meeting is emergency meeting. Do anticipate that will happen. That's really an extreme circumstance, a natural disaster, a critical incident. Um, I've been city attorney here in 13 years, only the only emergency meeting I participated in was the, the day when we discovered COVID was going to shut down the world and we basically had to do a bunch of things. So it's very rare. I just made, I pointed out to you, but I, it will not be something that this body um, uh, really has to deal with. So and it, uh, agendas must d contain a brief general description of each item to be discussed uh, at the agendas uh, on, uh, at the meeting. So um, we will have when we publish those agendas, they'll, they'll provide a, a description, 20 words or less is what the Brown Act uh, uh, says is okay, is permissible. Um, and so you'll see uh, see that on, on your agendas moving forward. Next slide, please. Uh, so with respect to items not on the agenda, um, yeah, the Brown Act again prohibits uh, action to be taken or discussion on a particular issue if it's not on your agenda. Um, you, or, as members of this committee or staff, may briefly respond to something that's raised by a fellow committee member or by a member of the public and then refer it to staff, uh, maybe ask a question. Uh, if you want to have a matter on the agenda, that's fine, but there cannot be discussion. If a member of the public wants you to discuss some particular charter amendment, then you would ask for that to be agendized at a subsequent meeting. Um, same with uh, any c comment that's brought brought before you by one of your fellow committee members. Again, as long as, it's, if it's not on the agenda, you can't discuss it other than briefly responding um, and or asking a question or referring it to staff. And someone always points out to me that the Brown, this particular section of the Brown Act uses the word brief three, three times in one sentence. So it, it really means brief means brief. Um, and then by two thirds uh, uh, vote of, this, of a particular legislative body, the legislative body can add something to the agenda if the need emo, uh, arose after, after if it, need for immediate action came after the posting of the agenda. Um, this is very infrequent too. I don't anticipate this being something that will be available or be utilized by this committee, but it is, if there is something urgent, if we were supposed to bring something back, well actually that's not even a good example, something that truly rose after we post the agenda. If we, if something, staff forgot something or whatever, we probably wouldn't be able to add it under that particular exception. How, does just asking to get something on the agenda, it goes on the future agenda or does it need a vote or how does that work? You know, that's a good question. Um, there, nothing requires a vote to, to we, you know, you, you, I know, cause Mr. Meek, you, you watch council meetings and we have that process in, in, on the council because 
you know, over time, things a lot of things got added to the agenda. We will try. I think our, our pro thinking right now is if board members, and commissions have things that they want to um, discuss, uh, we will put those things on at least for an initial discussion at a future agenda, uh, so that the, the board and, and the committee can have the opportunity to discuss it. But there's no formal rule requiring a vote to add something to the agenda. Um, you know, the third component of, of the Brown Act uh, that is very important and is essential to its, its functioning is the public access and participation component. Uh, we cannot require conditional attendance, meaning we can't require individuals who want to attend to provide their name or to sign in uh, or um, uh, to, you know, only be here for a certain amount of time. They're allowed to attend and they can be uh, anonymous if they choose. Uh, and then the public must have the opportunity to address uh, this board and committee at, at every meeting. Um, they have the right in two components. One is sort of to address any issue of general interest that's within the subject matter jurisdiction. So if we're talking, we, and that's why you see on the agenda, we had a portion for oral communication. So that was, that was just for things that are basically not on the agenda but within your subject matter jurisdiction. So if we're one day at a meeting, we're discussing uh, directly elected mayor and, and having council districts and somebody else wants to talk about, you know, the Department of Public Works. Well, that, that's not on the agenda. They won't be able to speak on the agenda items, but they'll be able to speak during oral communications and express their view. Uh, and then the public has to have the opportunity to address the, the, the body on agenda items before or during their consideration of it. So. Um, even this item, if there were members of the public who were here to speak, uh, they would have that opportunity to do so. Um, and can, then, you know, can I have it's a question. Yeah. How broadly construed are, is our jurisdiction, given that it's the charter? It's a good. That's a good question. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, the charter is um, pretty broad. I mean, it would have to relate to something that's in the charter or something that the charter could regulate, right? Um, if somebody wanted to say complain about something that they encountered. At the planning counter, for example, I would say that's not. But if they wanted to come and say the charter is too limiting on on how we conduct public hearings, for example, or the charter should be amended, I think that's that's more of a fair game issue. I think we'll kind of we'll see play play it by ear. Just uh, since we're talking about uh, addressing the legislative, can that be conditioned uh, in terms of how the public can address, or are there any conditions that can be applied to them? Um, there, you know, again, it has to be germane to the topic. So if they're speaking on agenda item, they have to speak on the agenda item. Um, we we can't impose reasonable time limits on those speakers. Um, so yeah, those are those are sort of the limitations that you can impose on the speakers. But other than that, um, obviously, if you know, there's other issues related to conduct during a council meeting um, that we can get into if there are questions on it. But yeah, those are the main limitations on on actually speaking uh, dur during during the council meeting. And obviously they, you know, they have to relinquish their time once they're up uh, and those sorts of things and we can, you know, turn off the microphone and those sorts of things if necessary. Uh, next slide, please. So there are some, generally speaking, you will, you know, we will be meeting here on, you know, we, on the city hall campus in this room. There are, the Brown Act does provide for some um, legal alternatives for a board member to, to participate by teleconference. Uh, the traditional teleconference rule, which was in place for a long time and is the general rule applied before COVID, before the post-COVID rules are in place, um, as long as the quorum was in Glendale and there was public and ADA, ADA accessible accessibility at each location, um, a member of the, of the committee who needed, for example, knew ahead of time that they were going to be out of town but wanted to participate, could participate as long as we post, as long as we have the location where you're going to participate. Um, and we post that location, um, not only here, but all, uh, on the agenda and, and post it here because we post every agenda on our bulletin board outside City Hall. But we also, you also have to post it at the location that you're at if you're the, if you're the member speaking publicly. And that, that, that I won't, uh, I won't um, downplay it. That sometimes is a challenge. Um, 
I've you know posting at hotels, Airbnbs, and things like it's it's challenged. So that we have to work through those logistics if that becomes an issue, and then that location has to be open to the public. So you know, those are th those are some of the challenges. But it is it is you know sometimes there there's a necessity for a board member or any member of a legislative body to be away out of town and, and still have a desire to participate, and we will work through those issues if necessary. And then the in this in the traditional teleconference scenario, uh, the, partic the participant the the board member who's participating Spain would have to do so by video or audio. Um, after um, when COVID hit and we couldn't meet in person, uh, initially the next slide, please. The um, the governor signed executive orders that allowed for remote meetings, so we were all participating via via in our case Teams. Other jurisdictions were doing it by Zoom or WebEx. Um, but so that after we kind of came out of COVID, the legislature decided it would it would make sense to still have some additional rules for um, allow remote participation in certain circumstances where there's just cause or where there are emergencies. Uh, for those types of, of uh, remote participation, um, again, the quorum must still be in a single physical public location in the city. Um, the public must be allowed, when, when somebody from this body is, is participating remotely, um, the public must also be allowed to attend and co comment remotely. Uh, and so that's why we, we have the telephone participation because we, it makes it a little bit easier for us to, to get participation that way. Uh, the remote uh, attending member must participate by, by video and audio, so it must be something like Zoom or Teams. Um, the use of this particular uh, tool is limited to um, Either three months in a row, meaning that remote participation is only allowed up to three minute, three months in a row, or 20% of the annual meetings, or two meetings uh, uh, maximum if the committee meets less than 10 times per year. And again, I'll get into some of the, the two the two scenarios where it's permitted, but um, those are some of the limitations. And then the member who's participating remotely under this exception uh, must disclose to the committee as well as to the public, if there's anyone present in the room that he or he, he or she is participating in that is 18 years or older. And again, the, the whole purpose behind the original teleconference rule and, and this particular exception is so that the public know, is aware that there are not other members of, uh, member, you know, there are other individuals in participating in a particular meeting. Uh, I think there's still some doubt, some distrust by our state legislator of local officials participating sort of behind closed doors, and this is one way just to make sure everybody's aware uh, who's in a room with somebody participating remotely. So these particular uh, just cause and emergency uh, exceptions are, uh, as it notes, applicable when there's just cause or when there's an emergency circumstance. So just cause, uh, the, the definition, next slide please. The, the, the definition of just cause under this, the statute is when there is a, a caregiving need, a need to, to uh, give care to either a, a dependent child, uh, a spouse, or, or an elderly parent. Or when the board member, or and this is the this is sort of still remnant of COVID, when the board member has a a, a contagious illness, whether it's had a cold, the flu, uh, a, a COVID, and uh, there's a there, there's a need for that person to not be in the room with with the rest of us, uh, or if you're traveling on city business, um, the board member who wishes or committee member who wishes to utilize one of these exceptions must do so, uh, must notify the legislative body as soon as possible, up to and including the time of the start of the meeting. And then the additional additional disclosures are required, but um, with this exception and the emergency family medical emergency, um, uh, you must, uh, the, the legislative body would have to take a vote to uh, to allow this particular individual to participate. The other exception is the emergency family medical emergency exception, uh, where if there's, you know, obviously where a family member has an emergency and that, that board member cannot be there for that reason, um, they can generally describe the emergency to the board and then again request the board, the body vote to approve their participation in the meeting and that happens at the beginning of the meeting. So that's sort of a summary of, of um, the, the Brown Act, the Open Meetings Act. I'm um, happy to answer any questions before we go on to the next part of the, the discussion related to public records. Regard <coughs> regarding remote meetings that you just spoke about, should any of these two types of attendance arise, are we required to, A, I, I recognize even if we're sick, but are we required to disclose our address, which would likely be home? And are we required to have that area open to the public? No, and that's, uh, no, the answer is no to both. That's, and that's you. why the reason for the exception. 
noting that you know you're sick, you're sick, you got to be home, and so at that point, the legislature did, decided to be a little bit more lenient in that regard. Good question. Any other questions? Okay. One other question: What happens if somebody or like violate the act? What's the cost? Oh, that's a good question. I, I, I didn't really get into the, the, the remedies, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, poignant question. Um, so th if there's a, a violation of the act, if someone alleges a violation act, the, the whoever is alleging it, whether it's a member of the public or and the district attorney has enforcement authority, both either criminal or, which is very unique circumstance, or, or civil, um, they have to provide notice to the public agency and give them the opportunity to cure that, meaning have, have, give them the opportunity to uh, address it, maybe have, it, have another meeting to correct the violation. So if, there's a, if you held a meeting without properly noticing it or you discussed something and took action on something that was not on the agenda, then, the, then th this public agency has the opportunity to fix it by holding a meeting and taking the action in, in accordance with the proper procedures. So that's the primary thing. There are uh, there are obviously civil penalty. You know, someone can seek civil enforcement, saying, you know, count, you know, city took some action they didn't do it properly. We gave them notice and opportunity to cure. They didn't, or they didn't do it right. Please, court, give an order and, and uh, invalidate that action. Um, and then the the just as I mentioned, there is a criminal uh, component to it if uh, a court were ever to find that the public agency violated the Brown Act with the intent to deceive the public, which obviously is a little higher standard than we just made a mistake or we, we made a good faith, we had a good faith misunderstanding of the statute um, where someone, where a, a court, uh, a district attorney can prove that a member, a member of a board committee or a, or a, a city and it acted to deliver, deliberately deceive the public, then there could be a criminal uh, penalty. But I don't know that I've ever seen that. Uh, but it is remedy. One more question, yeah. um, Attorney Garcia. So in the event that we opted to have a teleconference meeting for whatever reason, my same questions apply. Would we have to disclose our location, which perhaps would be our home, and do we have to have it open to the public? Well, if it's a teleconference meeting where you're not using the just cause or the uh, family emergency exception, Correct. then yes, that that would require that the location be noticed on the agenda, as well as um, that you know, the teleconference location, as well as that that space be open to the public. Okay. Any other? I, I had a question. Yeah. To clarify what you just said, I remember during COVID. Uh, the mayor would be in council. I think you'd be in council. The rest of the council would be, um, you know, zooming in right. or Team X or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, is that the sort of setup for a remote meeting, or was that just COVID? That was COVID. Yeah. So the 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 governor's uh, executive order, which allowed all the legislative bodies to meet remotely, um, was much more flexible than the current statute. So I'm confused by um, in a remote meeting, the quorum's got to be in one public place. Yeah, right. So that was that was that wasn't applicable to COVID, the COVID rules. So that it is now. But I'm not sure I understand that concept. I'm sorry. Um, I, how, how do you remotely meet in one public place? Well, you don't. I'm saying that. Uh, I, I see. Um, so the. When I say remote participation, it wouldn't be the whole committee or majority of you meeting remotely necessarily. It would be one or two or you know less than a majority if you had to meet because you, ha you had one of these emergencies or just cause reasons or you were meeting because you were going to be out of town on your own work or your own, then you could meet remotely. But to, you, to exercise any of these, the majority or the quorum of the body has to be in one location. Okay, thank you for those. Anything else? Okay, so um, next slide, please. Maybe it's up. Oh, it's up. Okay, so I'm going to just brief. The public record discussion will be much more brief. I just this is really to give you a sense of um, how this might apply to uh, in the context of the work that you will be doing. So the Public Records Act um, applies to require. Uh, 
cities, counties, other public agencies to provide to the public uh, any writings um, that are that discuss the, the government's business. And a public record is any writing containing information relating to the conduct of the public's business, prepared, owned, used, or retained. And those those words all have different meanings within the context of how the courts have uh, defined them over time and how the statute defines them. Uh, retained by any state or local agency, regardless of physical form or characteristics. So a writing is not just you know this. It is. It could be an email, a text, a uh, video. Next slide, please. Um, you know, tweets, uh, video. Oh, I said video already. So anything that that documents anything related to the city's business is a public record. Um, so, and the reason I'm we, we're raising the, in the context of this committee is to um, uh, is to for you to understand that. Um, the writings of this body are going to be subject to the Public Records Act request unless there's an exception. That's not just the reports we may give you, but it also any emails that you, you receive or send, any texts that you receive or send, uh, any social media postings that you send, um, that, well, any, any social meetings that we have on our system or that you might send that relate to the city's business. Um, and so they may be subject to disclosure. Uh, there are some exceptions. We'll get, you know, I don't want to get too, too far into the weeds on this because this was just to give you a sense that the writings that you you produce or receive related to this this um, uh, body's work uh, will be subject to the Brown Act. But there's, you know, there's a, an exemption for preliminary drafts or notes not retained in the ordinary course of the city's business. So there might be some initial drafts. Um, uh, or an initial comment that gets sent around, but that's, if it's not retained uh, in the ordinary course of business and it's really a draft and there's, there's no, uh, the interest in withholding that document uh, is, exceeds the interest in disclosure, then it may be withheld. Uh, there's a, there is a, um, a, there's an exemption for attorney-client uh, a record, so there might be times where most of the time, the, the, even the information that's coming from our office is going to be public information. We're providing you historical records, we're providing you some of the background, but there might be a legal question that gets raised at some point where we're, when we're acting as lawyers, then that might be subject to the attorney client privilege. And then there's going to be uh, privacy interest in withholding certain documents. Um, if it has, if there's personal information that pertains to any of you or that pertains to maybe a member of the public, uh, that, that would be withheld. Um, yeah. Um, so if someone's re requesting records and it's our personal email that's related to it, will they have access to all of our emails? It's a good question. So, um, so if there's, if you send an email uh, from your personal email account or from a te or a text, um, that is subject to the Public Records Act request. And what will happen is if we get a public records request for some emails sent to this board, we will, we will ask you to search your emails uh, that you, regarding, again, not all your personal, you, you, we won't have access to your emails, but we will ask you, please provide any e emails on your personal email account regarding this committee's business on this particular issue. You'll have to produce some to the city staff, and then if they're not exempt, we will have to disclose them. Um, that's good. I don't know, and we we we're. Oh, by the way, this is John Tatlin. He's the assistant city manager. He's just wishing we were that if we provide, we we're going to explore providing a city email for each of you. In which case, you'll be able to use that for the business of this committee and not have to use your personal email. So we will look into that, and we will get back to you. Um, you want to introduce yourself a little bit? And sure. I apologize for walking in a little bit late. I'm John Tiktalian. I'm the assistant city manager. I've been with the organization for about 22 years. Um, and while this is the first charter review committee that's, been ha that's occurred in a couple of decades, I do remember I had pulled a copy of the previous charter committee um, about 22 years ago when I was applying for a job and used that as the basis for understanding how government worked. So this is a, an interesting full circle moment for me. And thank you for uh, joining us and helping us amend and, and form the future of, of Glendale structure. So next slide, please. Um, we have we obviously have obligations in responding to public records requests. I do I do want to mention to you, um, if you sometimes you might get the public records, it might be sent to you. Can you please send me this? document you got or can you please send me some information that you received the city staff will will respond 
for you. So if you get a request, please forward that to, to Greg and myself so that we can make sure we have a system, we have a computerized system where we enter all public records requests. So we will get that and then we will make the, we will then obviously I'll reach to you to see if you have anything responsive that's not already, already on the city server. So we have this obligation to respond in 10, 10 days to say how we're gonna produce the records, whether we're gonna produce them, if we have records or if we don't, and whether there are any exemptions. Um, and then there will be some circumstances where we can extend that period by 14 days. Again, we don't, we don't necessarily have to produce all those records within those time periods if we're working towards getting them ready. There might be, there might be times where documents contain confidential information where we'd have to redact them, for example. So, um, but I just want to drive home that point. If you, and you might not realize you, you're getting a request. So just be kind, if someone sends you an email and say, I want this information, you know, that might be a request for public, uh, for public records. So please forward that to us so we can make sure we, we get that, that public records request uh, responded to. Any, any questions on the public records component? Again, I, this was a little bit more just a, a heads up so you're aware of issues. To whom do we send that email? Uh, about I'm, if we get a request for yeah, a record, I'll send it to to me and to Greg. Okay. Yeah, that would be for now. That would be the best way, and we'll we will make sure it gets. Again, our city clerk's office is the one that that uh, processes initially the public records requests, and then they get sent out to the departments to respond. In which case, even though you sent us the request, we may then be reaching back out to you, say, hey, do you have anything else in regards to this? Uh, it may not be an official request, but if they say, hey, I'm looking for such and such, go ahead and forward that to you. Absolutely. Um, and that, yeah, sometimes we, for example, they, they may say, I, I know the city had a document about this or that or other thing. You might not know what it is. We might not even know what it is, but we have an obligation on our end to then go see if we can find it and help the requester maybe narrow his or her research, search or, or give us a little bit more information so we can find it. But we have that obligation too to, to assist requesters with the request. So if you get something like that, that's a very good point. Please send that over to us. Um, I'm going to move over. This is the last piece of the sort of the educational, informational piece of it. Um, uh, the city council, as I mentioned, adopted a code of conduct uh, in 2021, um, which governs acceptable behavior and conduct um, for the boards and commissions, as well as for itself. It applies the code of conduct to itself. Um, the, the next slide, please. Uh, so, you know, overall, the, the, there, as I mentioned, the Code of Conduct has rules for dealing with each other, for dealing with the public, and dealing with the staff. So again, our goal here is, you know, just it, it ensure that we're practicing civility and decorum. Um, you know, if you have, if you disagree with your f colleagues on a particular issue, let's d agree to disagree agreeably um, and not be disagreeable. So please avoid personal attacks, personal comments. I uh, don't anticipate it's going to be an issue, so I'm really excited about that. And then let's demonstrate effective problem-solving uh, approaches to issues. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and the other, again, dealing with the public, um, let's uh, make sure that we're welcoming to speakers who come in and treat them with respect. Uh, let's be actively engaged. Um, I try to, you know, I know we all have, you all have jobs, you all have busy careers or, or busy lives, and so you will occasionally get text messages or emails that you have to respond to, but let's, let's try to keep that to a minimum. Keep an open mind on issues, even if you have a strong opinion about something, please, you know, not, do not be dismissive of each other or, or the public on a particular issue. Um, and then when the public comes to speak, obviously if you're gonna have questions, uh, you feel free to ask those questions, but uh, try to avoid debating or getting into an argument with a member of the public, uh, even though you may or may, uh, may disagree with that, that individual. Next, next slide, please. So the, the next component of the Code of Conduct uh, deals with uh, dealing with the staff. Uh, please you know, treat all staff as professionals. Um, if you, if the circumstances arises where you might, if you're frustrated with a staff member or you didn't get the information you thought you were gonna get, please uh, try to uh, uh, ask questions or, or address issues in a professional way. Um, please d uh, try not to uh, criticize an employee, uh, individual employee in a public meeting. If you have a concern, I mean, you feel free to, I, I, I'm the city attorney, so I take a lot of beating every Tuesday night, so I'm okay. <laughs> I got really thick skin, but um, you know, for other staff, 
um, you know, I, and you have an issue with some staff member, please come to me directly uh, or John. Uh, we, 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 we obviously want to hear if there are any issues, but please feel, do it in a more uh, non-confrontational setting. Um, it's important, obviously, not to um, get involved in administrative functions um, of, the, of the staff. Um, I would point out that um, if you, any of you are ever in the future or not involved in any political campaigns, uh, please do not solicit political support from staff. Um, it's important for you to understand on the attorney-client side of it, uh, our office represents the city or as an organization. Uh, in your role as board member and committee, we are representing you, but we're not your personal attorney. Um, so attorney-client advice is confidential as it pertains to uh, the committee versus the world, but it doesn't, it's not confidential as pertaining to if, if something, you raise something confidentially with me, I may have to raise it with the city manager's office or with the council, depending on the nature of the issue. The, the privilege is held by, by the city as an organization, uh, usually the council or the city manager, depending on the circumstances. And then please, um, if you have questions regarding a particular issue, we're gonna be dealing with a lot of different departments in terms of the charter provision. We might be looking at the Public Works Department or Glendale Water and Power or the City Attorney's Office. Uh, please work, if you have questions, if you have informational requests, please uh, uh, direct those towards Greg so that we can have one point of contact. We're not, we're not getting a bunch of different department heads getting contacted for particular information. We're happy to get to the information, but we wanna make sure it's getting all, everybody's getting, if you have a question, it might be something that we get that information and it, it's, it's in our, everybody's interest then for us to disseminate that to all of you. So please, please make sure you work through our, the, the staff assigned to this particular uh, yeah, body. During the course of the review, will some of the departments actually send the representative uh, yes, especially as it pertains to anything related to charter provisions that specifically impact their department. We anticipate that they'll be here to make presentations, ask questions, and, and whatnot. So, and then uh, the fourth component of, of this code of conduct relates to personal conduct. Um, you know, obviously, please, uh, you, you, I don't need to tell you this, but I am telling you anyway, uh, <laughs> avoid abuse of insulti insulting or profane conduct. Um, you know, phys physical or verbal abuse of staff or the public or each other will not be tolerated. Um, you know, be prepared for these meetings, attend them, uh, provide advance notice if you're gonna be absent. Uh, participate, we're asking all of you to participate in the meeting deliberations. We're not saying, you know, it, it, we understand there's gonna be times where you, you don't have a particular interest in issue or you don't have, you're not ready to speak and that's fine, but we are asking you to, to be engaged in, the, in, this, in these meetings. Um, do not ask or direct city employees to work on uh, uh, spend time on non-city business. Um, some of these are obvious, but um, they things have happened either here or in other cities, and so these th types, of, types of things end up in codes of conduct. Obviously, criminal activity will not be tolerated. It's important to main maintain confidentiality if you've been issued uh, an is uh, a memo on, uh, that's confidential, then it's, it's important that you maintain that confidentiality. Uh, do not engage in any conduct that will violate federal, state, or local anti-discrimination laws. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, more on personal conduct, obviously, uh, alcohol and drug abuse during a meeting or prior to a meeting where you're, it affects your ability to participate in the meeting is not gonna be tolerated. So, you know, please, obviously, if, you know, if, like, for example, you're, you, maybe you're working from, you're participating from off-site in a particular meeting, again, please do not engage in alcoholic or, or drug use during, during meetings. Um, and then, uh, <clears throat> next slide, please. Yeah, conduct with the media. Um, you know, we would just say, you, you know, you, while you are, you know, it, 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 you may be contacted by the media, our, our suggestion always is we have a media office in the city manager's office to contact the media, but it's important if you ever do talk to the media that you make it clear you're not speaking for the committee as a whole unless the committee has authorized you to speak um, or, um, or for the city as a whole. Um, those, those, con those communications should go through the city manager's office. Again, I can, we can't limit if you speak to the member of the media on a particular issue that before this board of commission, but we do encourage you to work, th work through uh, the media office uh, on those issues. Next slide, please. Um, social media, we kind of talked about this, um, some of the Brown Act limitations, but um, Again, if you are if you are on social media and you're talking about the work of this of this committee, please make sure that you disclose that they're your personal views and not the views of the committee or or the city. 
Next slide, please. So the, the code of conduct does have an enforcement uh, mechanism. Um, and again, if, if a, a member of any board or commission is found to have violated the code of conduct, the council can take action by uh, censuring a member of this board commission, removing a member of this board commission, or can refer to the board commission to take action and decide whether or not to censure uh, one of your own. So that's, again, it's a sort of a self-enforcement, but um, there are some enforcement tools. Um, so any questions on the code of conduct? Can we get a copy? Yes, sorry, I meant to bring it. Well, we will send it out. Um, okay. I don't know if you read the next item into the agenda. Yeah, yeah. Item 5B, City Charter Basics. Okay. Um, so we have a couple of, of uh, introductory uh, discussions or introductory uh, presentations on uh, the Charter City component of this discussion. Um, and. Again, I'll, on the next time when we talk about the, the committee's scope of work, we'll get a little bit more, um, give a little bit more background on how we got here. Um, but uh, as a charter city, the city the city of Glendale is a charter city, um, and the California Constitution uh, provides that uh, it's competent in any charter to provide rules, ordinances, regulations, and uh, pertain to what are called municipal affairs, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and um, that is in the California Constitution. The Constitution is, um, I mean, sorry, the, the Charter is like the Constitution uh, of, if you think about maybe a federal constitution or state constitution, it's the Charter, it's the, it's the top of the, of, the, of the rung for city government. Um, it's actually, uh, sometimes you might think of it, it, tell, it allows us to do certain things, but the actual law provides that it's really a limitation on the city's authority to do certain things. Uh, the city has the city council, or the city has the authority to take any action that's uh, beneficial to the city as a municipality. Um, and um, uh, the, the charter is, in essence, a limitation on that authority. It says these are the things that you must do when engaged in um, in, in your actions as a, as a city government. Next slide, please. So there, there are uh, 430, 483 cities, um, and 125 of those have city charters. Um, and for any of those that may have been reading up on this at all, th there have been more cities trying to become charter cities. Um, there, uh, I think there's a belief and we could talk about this throughout our committee's work, there is a belief that um, charter cities have some additional, uh, and they do, but th that there'll be some additional, um, they'll be able to lift some of the restrictions that the state is imposing on cities, uh, especially in the area of land use. So you've seen that, just, I think just in the last year, four cities have become chartered. Um, the, the California Constitution was significantly amended in 1896 to strengthen the municipal uh, charter city's home rule over municipal affairs. Um, and then uh, charter city law provides that regarding municipal affair, it governs over any California law of the same, on the same subject as long as it pertains to municipal affair. And I'll, I'll provide some examples of that um, on the next slide. So we've been, the city's been incorporated since 1906. Uh, we, the city tried to uh, enact a charter in 1913 and it failed. Um, but then the city, the city's voters ultimately approved a charter in 1921. Um, in one of our subsequent sessions, we'll go through a little bit what some of those charter amendments, well, obviously we'll, we'll discuss the charter, but we'll discuss what some of those charter amendments have been in the last hundred uh, or so years. Um, so, as I noted, it's, the, the city, as a charter city, has the authority to regulate in the area of municipal affairs, regardless of what a contrary state law might provide, as long as it, as long as it pertains to a municipal affair and is not a matter of statewide concern. So specifically in the, in the California Constitution, the, the Constitution provides that the city has the authority as a charter city to establish and regulate its own police force, establish the form of its local government, 
uh, whether it, for example, we are a, what's known as a council manager form of government, meaning we have a city council and we have a city manager that runs the, is the executive of the city and runs the day-to-day -day affairs of the city, taking policy direction from the council. Other charter cities have what's called the strong, strong mayor form of government, which is what the city of Los Angeles has. Um, and then other other issues, the, the formation of the departments of the city and those sorts of things um, are, are deemed to be municipal affair. Elections, um, the city has the authority to um, run the elections uh, as it see fit, sees fit, uh, as long as it doesn't comply with particular uh, state laws related to voting rights uh, or, or things of that nature. Now, in reality, we incorporate much of the state election code into our own code, but where we wish to deviate it from it, we can do so and we have done so. And we'll, we'll discuss some of those down the road. But again, this is a good example where um, we have this authority to operate as a municipal fair in our elections, but in some circumstances, this, the state has said, you have that right, but there are certain things we're gonna make sure that you do, for example, in the area of voting rights. The, leg the legislature in 2001 adopted what's called the California Voting Rights Act, and the courts have said, not, re not regarding the city's own charter, uh, in the case of the city of Palmdale, they had a charter city that said, they had a charter which said they were gonna be at-large districts, um, the California Voting Rights Act says you, you must have, sorry, the, the Lancaster, ha Palmdale has at large, or they did have at large districts, and they were sued under the California Voting Rights Act, uh, claiming that they were required to go to districts because their, their, their at large system um, discriminated against Latino voters. And the city tried to say, well, but we're a charter city, we have authority over our elections. You can't tell us how to run our elections. And the court said, well, th while that's true, in the area of voting rights, that's a statewide affair, and at, at the state legislature was authorized to adopt this, this legislation and require you to go to districts if the particular statute applied. Another municipal affair is uh, the, hi the hiring, a election, appointment, removal of public officers and employees that is within our, our uh, ambit uh, as a local municipality. Some some issues that are statewide concern, and again, this I'm just giving you a very, very high level of this. We will get into this a little bit uh, throughout our process here. Um, Trafical, traffic and vehicle regulation, the tort claims, uh, access to affordable housing, uh, regulation of schools, these are all things that, are, that the courts have de deemed to be matters of statewide concern, meaning we are preempted. Uh, the traffic and vehicle code one is a good example. Um, it's, it is largely preemptive of, of things that cities may wanna do in the area of traffic and vehicle regulation, except where the legislature has specifically said, cities, you can do this. So a lot of times we do hear from residents who might be frustrated, we can't do a particular, we can't change the speed limit, we can't uh, you know, require limit parking in certain areas where we have to allow it, that, those sorts of things. Um, and that's because we are preempted under, under the state uh, constitution. Next slide, please. Mike? Yeah. Uh, just so it doesn't mislead anyone, uh, could you just say something in general about uh, challenges uh, under the California Voting Rights Act really haven't been judiciously determined yet based on the Santa Monica lawsuit and what's been going on with the Supreme Court and Appeals Court? Sure, I mean, I could just briefly touch on it because it has been, these issues have been litigated and they continue to be litigated. Um, Santa Monica was challenged under the California Environmental Rights Act, not on a charter city issue, but on whether it applied in their case, whether the city was violating that statute. Um, so yeah, no city, there hasn't been any spe specific determination about what is required to prove a, um, a California voting rights uh, violation. The, the California Supreme Court has ruled these are, the, these are the criteria, but now they have to go back and determine whether or not Santa Monica was, was truly violating that statute. But the Palmdale case is an important case, was decided maybe about 10 years ago, and said charter cities, even though you have a charter that may say you're an at-large system, if you are violating the California Voting Rights Act, you have to go to districts. Um, so there's a process that the, the courts follow. Um, to uh, determine whether or not something is a municipal affair and the city, a charter city can regulate it, or whether or not um, uh, it is something that is preempted by state law. Um, you, uh, and 
this this table in the in the presentation kind of goes through it, but um, basically, the, the the general rule is, and the people the legislature is not always aware of this, but the legislature doesn't necessarily determine what is or what is not a municipal affair. Uh, the the issue is one that is, is borne out in the court decisions, and the courts focus on whether there's some action that's really a municipal affair, or there's a reason for the state to have an interest in superseding what legislative bodies will do, and then that state interest has to be the, the state, legisla state legislation has to be reasonably related to that concern. I'll give you some example. Well, one one example that I think some of you may be aware of, in the area of land use. You know, we have we have uh, in our city we have a very comprehensive zoning scheme that applies. Um, for many years, we did not allow uh, what are called accessory dwelling units (ADUs). Um, because there was a provision in state law that said we didn't have to if we could make certain findings. The legislature subsequently got rid of that exception. Excuse me. And so you might ask, well, don't we have authority to regulate zoning in our, in our uh, jurisdiction? And the answer to that is yes. However, the state made findings that because ADUs uh, increase the supply of affordable housing, and it, and it is unquestionably in the state's interest to ensure additional affordable housing. That issue was sort of beyond dispute. The cases have decided it. The state is authorized to um, impose this requirement over all cities, including charter cities. The same applies to density bonus uh, issues um, and, and those sorts of things. So even though we have, as a charter city, the uh, unquestioned authority to regulate zoning, uh, regulate the use of land in our city, the courts have held over and over again that the state has the right to impose some restrictions uh, to ensure its policy goals, whether it's affordable housing or ensuring clean energy or whatever. If it's a, something that applies across uh, uh, municipal boundaries, the state will have the authority to, to impose regulations above and beyond what local, local municipalities may want to want to impose. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Um, did you read? That was a discussion on sort of, uh, we're gonna, I, I figured it would, rather than giving you a very deep lecture on um, uh, sort of the charter city rules, as we go through these different sections of the charter, I think we'll be discussing some of these contexts in a little bit more detail. So as we do that, we'll have the ability to discuss some of these concepts as they apply to our city charter. Um, so the next slide, please. So. Um, before I discuss this, I just to give you a little background, as you probably were, how did we get here? Um, starting in 2022, I think the city council started a discussion of whether or not we should convert uh, transition to from our at-large election system to um, uh, having districts and whether we should have a directly elected mayor. So we we started that discussion and. Um, uh, there's a process under the California Voting Rights Act, which, I'm sorry, there's a different statute that governs this, that requires us to go through all these public hearings as part of that, so we were doing that. We were presenting information to the city council, um, and then as part of that, the council said, well, we should study some other things like, um, uh, we should study some other things like um, the council compensation salaries for council. So we, um, uh, we had those discussions. We were, the council was considering putting something on the ballot for this most recent municipal election that was held in March. Uh, decided to hold off on that and said, you know what? Since we have we haven't come to agreement on these principles, and there are other things that we've been talking about over the years, let's let's impanel a charter review committee to look at these issues and look at some of the other issues that that the committee we may want to look at, and then we anticipate the council as well will we'll probably weigh in as well. So I just want, these are some of the key areas where our, our charter currently regulates. It, there, there's a title that dis discusses what uh, powers and d uh, duties and authority the, um, the, the city of Glendale has, not just the council, but the city. There are rules regarding uh, how, again, as I mentioned, how our officers and employees are either elected, hired, appointed, retained, removed. There are provisions regarding our elections, regarding our city council, regarding all the departments, including the city manager and city attorney, how the boards and commissions are created. Uh, there are many provisions regarding our fiscal administration, so the budget, how it's created, who adopts it, how the general general water, Glendale Water and Power Department, how their their financing is, is structured. 
There are rules regarding how we implement our city planning processes, and there's an extensive chapter or title uh, in, in the um, charter regarding our civil service system. So, um, you could go to the next slide, please, Greg. Oh, yeah, please. Item 5C, scope of work. So, so for now, I'll, I'll just say this is, again, this is very preliminary. Um, we anticipate having additional discussions about this, um, both, you know, with the council and frankly with this, with this group. Um, but again, some of the items are to discuss the directly elected mayor, um, the, the district's expansion of the city council. One of the issues that came up when we were discussing whether, whether we should have a directly elected mayor uh, is, well, will, will the public be confused by having a directly elected mayor and having a city manager? So we should have a discussion about what are going to be the roles of the directly elected mayor, what are going to be the roles of the city manager, making sure, because overall I think the council members who are in favor of this still wanted to kind of maintain that dichotomy, uh, but let's make sure that nobody confuses the mayor uh, with the city with the city manager um, in terms of duties um, we'll discuss compensation and salary we'll discuss the civil service system uh, there are some uh, changes that the council wants wants to consider as part of that um, that are in, embedded in the charter a lot of cities have very basic discussion of the civil s system in the charter and then the council or their civil service board or the personnel board will then make up the rules in our case every, a lot of the rules are actually embedded in our charter so uh, the council is, is uh, desires to look at maybe putting some flexibility there um, just to let you know that all those changes regarding the civil service system will also require the city to, to meet and confer with our labor associations as we go through that process. Um, so we, we anticipate that'll be, that, that's a little wrinkle that will apply uh, compared to some of these other items. And then there'll be some cleanup items, these, these location of council meetings and urgency ordinances. Those are just little quirks in our, in our uh, charter that we may, we may want to look at. Um, there are some other cleanup items we're going to look at as well, and then I, I anticipate we'll go to council to make sure that, again, that they're comfortable with these items, that they have any other items to, to look at, and then that we will um, uh, come back to you and start laying out some of the concepts here, and, and these, are, these are some of the issues, these are... Um, this is what the, the council wants you to look at. The, the council wants input from this committee on whether you think it's a good idea to go to districts to have a directly elected mayor. And then we'll have those discussions. Um, I will note that as part of the process that the council engaged in related to the districts, we were required to prepare draft maps and go to the public and do that. I don't think we're gonna have the, the committee weigh on what those districts should look like. But we, the, the definitely the council is interested in, in this committee's opinion on whether it would be a good thing for Glendale to go to council districts and, and, and have a direct elected mayor along with some of these other changes. So that's kind of a summary of what the work is um, for now, but I anticipate this will, this will change. We, because the committee has till, because the next election is in June of 2026, we, we, we have the rest of this year and next year to really get into the weeds on some of these items uh, as the committee desires. So I'm happy to answer any questions regarding the scope of work. If you have questions, if you have ideas that you want us to pass along to council when we brief them the next time, we'll have, it, we'll have a discussion with them probably in the next month or so. Is the scope limited to the items that you indicated or anything that's changed in the future by council? It, I think it could change, yeah. And I think, you know, it's your question. Well, in other words, is, is the scope uh, limited to this and anything that is no, changed no, by council, no. or is it open to any, but anything that is brought up by members of the committee? No, I, I think we we want to seek your input on once you, and that's why, you know, we provided the charter, so if you want to take a look, dig in and provide thoughts. I think depending on that, how many items there are that the committee wants to look at, we may need to check in with council to make sure we cover, it's a scope that we agree we can all get to between now and the end of next year. Um, but yeah, with, I mean, the, the council did not uh, say it has to be, it's definitely not limited to these items. These are just the items I know they want to talk about because that's why we, we got here in the first place. About the, have a like better understanding of the scope of the work that we are going to, uh, discuss together so let's say the first item directly directly elected mayor 
Are we going to discuss whether that's a good system for the city of Gunde or not? Is that part of our job? Yes. I think two things, two components to it. What is it? It would it be a good ch change for the governance of the city to have a directly elected mayor, and we, when we bring you information, we'll bring you what we we heard is the pro arguments and the con arguments because that was discussed at council already and discussed in the public, and then we will also say we will also seek the the committee's input on, on how it should if you if we did have a directly elected mayor, how should it work? I mean, should should that, for example, I'll just give one example. In some cities with directly elected mayor, the directly elected mayor doesn't have a vote on council, but he or she vetoes certain actions of the council. Um, whereas in other cities, like city, our neighbor city of Pasadena, the mayor has a vote, and then uh, it's a he right now. He uh, th he votes, but, but it takes five uh, votes of the eight-member council to take any action in Pasadena. So those are the types of things. Is it good governance to that go to a directly elected mayor? And then is how how should it work? And we'll give you options on ways that different cities do it, and then we'll seek your input and we'll have a discussion. And once we decide on that issue, it goes to the city council and they vote on it, and then they decide whether they're going to accept our like, like recommendation or reject it? Ultimately, yes. I mean, they'll, they'll will, they will, we, what, what we anticipate is we won't go to the council every time the commission makes a recommendation. You'll make a recommendation, then when we come at the end, near the end of the committee's work, we'll put together all those recommendations, make sure that you're okay with it, uh, take a vote, and then we'll go to the council and say this is where this is where the, the committee felt the changes should be made to the charter. Mike, uh, when does our final report need to be finished? Because council has to weigh in and then it has to go on the June ballot, right? right. It, I mean, charter changes have to be voted on by the public. Correct. So I don't know the exact, it's, uh, that's why we're shooting for the end of next calendar year. Um, technically, though, I mean, we have the, the council has to vote to put these on the ballot. 88, no more than 80 days before the June election, so that takes you to March. Obviously, we don't. We want to give council the time to review your work, so that's why we are really shooting for the end of the next calendar year. If we have a buffer of January 2026, maybe, but that's kind of what we're thinking. We really want to try to get into it, and we we do think. I mean, between now and end of uh, 2025, we should have enough time to to get get because into these issues. They kind of ran out of time when they were talking about yeah putting some of these things on the. Uh, election for November. Correct. Yeah, so we, we, we do want to, we intend to be on the staff side, be diligent in getting you information so you can have these discussions and, and provide input. Uh, Mr. Flower? Uh, do you anticipate, and this kind of goes along with Alan's question, like the, I'm, I'm curious about what our final product is supposed to look like or what people anticipate that final product look like. Are, are we expected to produce a series of just recommendations for things that could be changed and how they could be changed or to actually provide a draft and if, of, of those changes? And if we're doing the draft of those changes, are we just doing pieces or is this a amended and restated? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. I, I don't anticipate it would be an amended and restated. Um, I do anticipate though, um, I don't know, Lucy doesn't buy a microphone, but she would be a great resource to address this question because um, she, she worked on the 2005 amendments and we did, we took like 22 amendments to the council with the, I mean, the committee weighed in on the language and everything, correct? That's right. I think um, initially what we did was we put together the list of recommendations, the ideas behind the recommendations, took them back to council. Um, council then opined on which ones they wanted to see move forward, and then our office prepared the actual language. And then the, the committee had that, uh, the opportunity to, to look at the language before? I, I don't think so, because it was mostly legal language yeah. that we put on there as to how to frame it, but right. the direction came from the committee as to which of right. them should move forward. Time permitting, I think we would it, we would endeavor to try to have language for you to weigh in on as well. Speaking for myself, I'd like to see the language yeah, before because yeah. whatever the, whatever <laughs> goes on the ballot is going to be put forward as the, this is the commission's Understood. recommendation. And, so. and frankly, I, I do think the council. That's why we we push, they pushed it out till 2026 so we could get more public input engagement on the on the process. Any other questions on that process and? Uh, just a, a, a thought, maybe a suggestion. Uh, some of these items um, have a very lengthy history behind them yeah. and volumes of material that have been prepared. I've seen some of them at council meetings. Um, to the extent that we know some of these are definitely going to you know, be reviewed, if there's any way that staff can 
create a set of links of here's all the things pertaining to this item that in the last two years have come up. That would be helpful at least as I start to think through, think through how do I yeah. process this information rather than me going through and trying to sift through and you present. I mean, I think if something along those lines were produced, it would help us okay. get educated on the items. I will talk to the staff and we'll, we'll try to work that, th work that out. Just a quick question going back to the Brown, um, Brown Act. Since the discussions will be public, are we allowed to um, discuss any of those topics outside of the meetings with the public? Or let's say we discuss this topic and you kind of want to t tell people what you've been discussing. For example, at your office, you want to say what was discussed during yeah. the meeting. Yeah, I mean, these meetings since are all pu public, so it's, public. it's okay. all public. And again, you know, part of the reason, frankly, I think the council, you're all involved members of our community, so I, I think they, there's always an anticipation you're going to be, you're going to be involved with other members of the public, getting input and that sort of thing. So that's that's perfectly acceptable. Okay. One last question. Yeah. Uh, are we going to be breaking down the charter, like into chapters, subchapters, whatever, and we're doing, working our way through the charter that way, or do we bring it up and put it on the agenda? Because you said you'll be doing presentations. That that's a good question, uh, Mr. Meek. I, so some of these the, the topics sort of at the top of the list. I know we we want to try to tackle quickly. Um, but yeah, we I think we anticipate at the same time that there will be, you know, if, if, if especially if the committee has certain topics they want to look at or address, and we will try to put those in an order so we can bring them to you in chunks um, and have that discussion. So it won't be going from page one to page ninety or whatever. It'll be going to these topics wherever they happen to be in the charter or not in the charter. You know, I've, I'll, I, that's how we as a staff prefer it. Um, but you know, the committee has a different desire. We, we, we can certainly take that direction. Uh, I would, I would, I, maybe what I would suggest is like when we get the next agenda, we'll have a little bit more detail on some of these proposals, and then and then you will have op opportunity hopefully to you know look at the charter. We'll have we'll hopefully get these these links to some of our past most recent past reports on these items, and then when you come in, we can have that discussion of how you want to prioritize the work. It, it just seems like if that's going to happen, we'll need a little advanced warning so we can do some research before we come into the meeting. Yeah, and again, the idea would be we would provide this, like provide all the materials that the council's discussed in the last two years, and then you would have it, but also we will present the information to you. We'll, we will summarize it for you as well so that you can digest it that way too and ask questions about it. Um, and then and then we can discuss future issues because I think what we intend to do is not only go through this but we will provide a summary of some of the charter provisions uh, we I think we'll also provide a, um, a summary of some of the um, charter amendments that have happened in the past 20 years besides the committee that, that met 20 years ago we have we've amended the charter a number of times in, on individual bases we will discuss those as well so you have that background as well Any other questions on that part of it? Okay. Are we still on 5C? Technically, yes. Okay. We'll go to the next item, Greg. Item six, future agendas. So besides the items that we discussed, is there anything in particular? Mr. Flower. Are we gonna select a chair? Yeah, I mean, are we gonna have an organization that that on the next agenda, or w um, we we'll put that on the agenda. Um, there's so there's two ways, right, to to go about this. We weren't trying to dominate the conversation. I anticipate this meeting we'd be talking more than we will in the future ones. When we've had these limited scope committees, like we had a pension review committee about three two years ago, we did have. Um, in that case, we had a facilitator, and we had to sort of facilitator lead the meeting. So one 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 model would be for someone from staff, whether it's me or somebody from the manager's office, kind of lead the meetings. But if you want to go with the chair model, there's some benefits to that too, especially if we, things get more um, 
you know, they get more, I don't want to say they're going to heat it, but if they get, there's more debate, maybe it's more appropriate to have a chair. We'll put that on the agenda and then you can discuss whether to have a chair and then if you want to move forward with the pointing chair, we'll, we'll put that on there. Mike? Yeah. Because um, I, I know it came up at council when they were considering um, putting some charter amendments on the November ballot, but um, I just wanted to point out that I've forgotten what the rule is, but when charter amendments go on the ballot, they really have to be separate items. I mean, you might have 22 right. items people have to vote on. They don't get lumped together for the most part, correct? For, for the most part. There's, so there's a rule called what's called the single subject rule, meaning basically a charter amendment has to cover just one particular topic. And it's, it, there's, it's a kind of a fluid concept in the case law. Unless we were doing sort of an amended or restated, where we're asking the voters to approve a whole new charter, which that I don't I don't believe that was the the, the charge of the council. Uh, you, we need to break them up. That's why when we did the amendments in 2005, there was 22 separate amendments because they all cover separate separate subjects. Did they all passed. They did, but again, it was like Lucy said, it was it was not. Other than a couple of them, I wouldn't say they were overly substantive. Um, we've had some where we did one in 2000. 13 or 15, where we had three charter amendments, um, and and they all failed. Um, so, because one of them was unpopular, the other the other two failed as well. So, um, that's why you know it, it's good to break them up too. So one doesn't take down if one of them's un controversial, it won't take down the rest of them. Agreement. So there's like 12 member, members. So like, what if it's like there's six six split? Is it like a tiebreaker, or like we continue to discuss until we come to a, a, an agreement? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. We weren't anticipating the council selecting 12, but they, they just called an audible on us. But, but I think the reality is, if it was tied, I mean, technically that's as a recommendation. That's a, that's a no. It's not moving forward. But we would obviously be telling the council the count the committee was tied six six. So there was support for this particular concept. It didn't just get majority. And then the council will take that for what it's worth and decide if it's, it's worth moving forward or not. Sorry to be a nudge. Um, are we subject to the local conflicts code? And more importantly, do we have to file Form 700? No, I think there's an exception for um, uh, short term. I forget what the word is. Okay. But the, we looked at this with okay. pension review. Thank and you. We found the answer, yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Um, in our process of researching, are we allowed to do like anonymous polls to staff to get their opinions? I can't tell you what to do. Um, I, you know, I w my suggestion would be though to try to work with the staff that's assigned to this committee and let us, if you have questions about how some an operation works or whatever, let us make the contact with the department at issue and and bring you input in that way. Um, yeah, I anticipate it's possible too. We might at some point contact, have work with the associations mm -hmm. and get their input as well. So that those are the associations that represent the employees. So if they have input, they'll, they'll, I'm sure they'll provide it through their associations as well. Okay, well, if there's nothing else, I think the next item is adjournment. Unless you have anything else, any of the comments or questions? No, we had that already. Okay, well, th thank you. Can I get a motion to adjourn from somebody? Yeah, item seven, adjournment. Okay. Can I have a motion to adjourn? I'll make the motion. So what do I say? I'll start. Okay, we're adjourned. Okay, we're adjourned at 6.47 p.m.